Congratulations, you have successfully survived 2023 no worse for wear. Or at least that's what my therapist tells me. And you know, I'm not really one for dwelling on the past. There's a reason why I haven't made one of these videos until now, besides the blatantly obvious. But generally speaking, 2023 was an utter snore for animated movies. That's not invalidating the good stuff we did get this year, but I've seen a lot of people act like last year was one of the best years for animated movies in recent memory. And I do think it's important to value other people's perspectives in the cartoon community because implying otherwise is practically an invitation to firebomb your place of residence and the value that others see in films that I personally did not like. There's certainly a reason or two for why so many people look at this year positively and that should be respected. My counterpoint is that I watched the Miraculous Ladybug movie this year and overall I'd say 2023 has been uh, confusing for animation. Things people wanted to be good were bad, things people expected to be bad were positively received, long dead shows came back from the grave, the approach to animation in general is beginning to shift in a more stylized direction. Gumball Watterson shot Dream dead in Miami or something, and with the looming threat of AI taking over the industry, Warner Bros continuing to be an utter embarrassment, with John Warner Brothers himself thinking he could get away of locking away the Looney Tunes until Bugs Bunny himself dropped an anvil on his head, the entire industry looking just a few more scandals away from going on strike, and whatever the flipping cussing flip happened to Lord and Miller, for them to think forcing their animators to make patch notes for Spider-Verse on top of the treatment they were receiving was possibly a good idea or needed in any way, but it's beyond anyone's guess and beyond a release date. Like, I won't get into the whole controversy here because it'll probably consist of me swearing for two hours. So just imagine Lord and Miller eating the animator's loved ones in front of them while they animated Miguel O'Hara with a Snapchat filter. All of this was to say 2023 was a very weird year for animation. And while I could do the boring thing and talk about the hundreds of generic bargain bin animated films that no one watches, Rock Dog 3 does not exist, it is not a real movie because I said so. I'm going to be strictly ranking and reviewing all of the films I've seen myself this year. Though admittedly I haven't watched a ton of stuff this year. I mean, I've definitely watched quite a bit, but I have unfortunately mostly stuck to watching a lot of big western releases than I usually do. I'll still have some overseas animation and more obscure films on here, but to make up for the lack of them, I'll dedicate a segment at the end of the video to highlighting some animated films I've personally taken an interest in that I don't see many people talking about, and when they finally get a western release in 2024, I'll finally try and include them in next year's ranking video. So anyway, here are the tiers. I will not be going in any particular order, and everything will be chosen randomly. I'll try not to stay on some of these films for too long, as I have reviewed a handful of them already. And of course the obligatory, this is what I think, not what you think. Direct any and all death threats towards my Twitter where I will courteously invite you to drink my piss. Before we get to that though, we need to talk about today's sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Food delivery is cool. You know what's cooler though? Healthy food delivery. Do not click off the video. HelloFresh offers a streamlined, easy to use service that you have complete control over. Delivering fresh ingredients and easy to follow recipes straight to your door less than a week after you order them with a completely flexible schedule to best suit your lifestyle. Just choose your recipes and selected delivery dates. HelloFresh handles the meal planning and the shopping, so all you have to do is open your box of pre-portioned ingredients and get cooking. At this time of the year, everyone's looking to revamp their eating habits and start the year on the right track. Let HelloFresh be your partner for a wholesome 2024, with health forward options like calorie smart and protein smart recipes. Plus, HelloFresh is giving all subscribers to their service free breakfast for life. That means you'll enjoy totally free breakfast item with every single HelloFresh delivery. And for someone like me who regularly forgets to eat their breakfast, this is more than appreciated and helps me kickstart my day with a distinct absence of sitting on my floor and slowly decompose. If this all sounds interesting to you, then click the link in the description below or use my code PogCartoonSheet free and get free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video and let's get back to business. Honestly, the most I can actually say about Ruby Gilman and the main reason its existence annoys me, honestly has nothing to do with the movie itself, but rather its unfortunate timing. While everyone was busy glazing the sin off of Puss in Boots The Last Wish at the beginning of 2023, which some of you may be surprised to hear came out at the end of 2022, I was stuck observing all of the hype that DreamWorks was getting from a distance and greatly anticipating how funny it was going to be when they released their next movie only to fall short of people's inflated expectations. DreamWorks' entire strategy is throwing anything and everything at the wall and saying what sticks. It's what makes them so admirable to me, and I made an entire video explaining that, which then got misinterpreted by large groups of cretins as me glazing DreamWorks' meat just because of The Last Wish, since Ruby Gilman had released and disappointed everyone who thought it was going to be some kind of masterpiece. My video didn't age poorly at all, it was a bang on actually. People were riding the Disney hate train for a while and clung to Last Wish as if DreamWorks was going to take their place, completely misunderstanding that DreamWorks just releases whatever they feel like regardless of if it's any good. They're inherently experimental. They're 
track record proves this. So no, DreamWorks did not fall off and they never have. Ever. They have been eerily consistent with their inconsistent quality for their entire existence. And it's for this reason that I was able to go into Ruby Gilman with appropriate expectations. Which is why I'm comfortable in saying that my expectations of this being a film fully intended to be watched on a dirty, slowly overheating Kindle fire by eight year olds on a car journey to Legoland was entirely accurate. I'm having trouble remembering half the scenes in this one. It has its charms, there's a handful of good jokes and the animation is fine. Can't say I'm all too crazy about the art direction, but I don't think anyone was judging my reactions to the trailer. The story is uninspired, you've seen better movies that tackle the exact same themes before, yada yada yada. I could keep yapping, but there are far more interesting films that I want to talk about today. Honestly, not a single movie has been released this year that has made me change my opinion so much in such a short amount of time. My thoughts on Mutant Mayhem were all over the place when I first saw it. While there's absolutely no denying that this film is a visual marvel, just absolutely drop-dead gorgeous artwork and animation, and it can be argued that this is the most unique and endearing take on the Turtles themselves in a good while, with the voice acting itself bringing a ton of charm and humour that I really liked, I really did not like this film when I first saw it because I thought the script was super lazy, and it was clear it had Seth Rogen's grubby mitts all over it with the amount of groan-worthy reference humour. Each scene played out like an abridged explanation of what would have actually happened. You cannot tell me all the villains suddenly turning good within 30 seconds was not rushed, and it overall felt like the film never really treated its story with the sincerity it needed. But those were my original thoughts. I've rewatched it a few times and I've come to actually like the film a fair bit, though I'd hesitate to call it a masterpiece. The chemistry between the characters is absolutely fantastic, and the improv between the turtles felt super authentic and made them feel like modern-day teenagers without being cringe. I thought that was illegal. The action scene sequences were fantastic, the soundtrack is loaded with bangers, both licensed and original, though I'm not too sure what was going on with the naming for some of these tracks. I mean, name the last family-friendly animated movie you watched that had a track called Dipshits on a Roof. This movie deserves the Oscar for that alone. But while I do like the film, the script and story are still shockingly weak to me. There is an ungodly amount of exposition, and they try passing it off like it's all observant meta-comedy, but it's still super lazy. I had reservations when the opening scene had the leader of the operation dumping a ton of information that the soldiers themselves should already know but nearly every scene is full of that kind of exposition and it really drags the narrative down and makes it feel insincere. Also, the jokes outside of the turtles really suck. Excited to see what they do for a sequel, but I can't say I was too impressed with the film overall. It was cute though. <laughs> Three, two, one. Disney. I was excited for Nimona already, as someone who read the graphic novel years prior, and seeing Netflix bring it back from the dead after Disney terminated an entire studio over it got me even more excited. But man, I was still surprised at how much this movie rocks. It honestly makes sense why Disney tried to kill it, besides wetting themselves because of the LGBT themes. It makes nearly every single movie they've released in the last five years look like they were designed by ants. And Christ, it has been a while since I've seen a family movie tackle sensitive subject matter head on like this. I love all these stupid characters. I love how the film tastefully covers systemic oppression and gender identity without being pandering or restraining itself. And while I'd hesitate to call an animated film being released by a corporate entity truly rebellious, I cannot deny that this film comes from a place of love and care and you can really feel it. It's a miracle it exists at all, and I'm so thankful Netflix picked it up, even if they aren't the best themselves when it comes to throwing away gold. And when you look at how much universal praise this movie received and the awards it's been nominated for, then looking over to Disney and Pixar turning up diddly f compared to everyone else, it makes everything just that little bit funnier. I'd complained that in some areas the animation and lighting look a tad unfinished, but this is still a gorgeous, entertaining, and beautifully written film, and definitely one of the best animated films to release this year. <laughs> I already reviewed this movie in my big retrospective on all of Disney's Wimpy Kid movies, so I'll try and keep this brief. Cabin Fever is technically the best of the Disney Wimpy Kid trilogy because it actually appears to have a heart, being a Christmas film and all. Though by all accounts, this is still a garbage movie. The animation and art style is still ugly as sin, very few jokes were actually funny, over 50% of the film felt like it was actively sucking out my soul from how boring it was, and even though I do like the ending quite a bit, the fact we were robbed of a much more interesting and entertaining film given it cut off two quarters of the original book's story is very annoying. Especially because out of all of the Wimpy Kid books I read as a kid, Cabin Fever was one of my least favourites. I respect that it took the parts it did adapt and expand upon them to fit a free act structure, similar to how the vastly superior live action adaptations did, but all it did was make the film feel bloated and time consuming. Maybe they'll do better if they keep making more of these, but you can count me out, so I don't have much interest. <laughs> 
The only reason this movie is here is by pure technicality. Yes, this was a theatrical release that did in fact happen, but by all accounts, this is not a Demon Slayer movie the way that Mugen Train was. Whereas Mugen Train was an actual movie from start to finish, To the Swordsmith Village is so frustratingly f***ing pointless I'm f***ing bricks just thinking about the fact that I wasted an entire night watching it. It's just three poorly stitched together episodes of the Demon Slayer anime, with its only selling point at the time of release being that it included the first episode of the show's third season which had not been revealed yet. Well, excuse me if I was catching up on season three by the time I got around to watching what was shown to me as a necessary watch if you were invested in Demon Slayer. Aren't I a twat? That's not to say these episodes themselves aren't of quality, Demon Slayer's animation is of course fantastic, even if the story isn't. But this is such a pointless film and a massive cash grab, just lazy to its very core. Down to Weezer where you belong. <laughs> As if I'm ever gonna forget the absolutely insane discourse this movie spawned, and I'm gonna say right now that as a Mario fan, I definitely enjoyed this film. Its perfectly crafted animation and references to the games are clearly from a place of love, and the threat of assassination if Illumination f***ed it up, and it was great to see the originally controversial voice actor picks turn out well. Even Chris Pratt as Mario wasn't too bad, though that is not an excuse to immediately cast him as Garfield, there will be murders over this, I assure you. Jack Black stole the show, obviously, but everyone did a great job of bringing these characters to life. Purely as a film for fans, this movie is pretty great, but as an actual film, it leaves so much to be desired, and most people interpret this as giving Super Mario a deep story and character development for some reason, when that's not it at all. It's just very evident the film is made only for fans, and all of that stuff, for as much as I love it, is purely cosmetic and hides the film's autopilot story and lack of an actual soul outside of its visuals and faithfulness to the games. It's not a big ask to say the Mario movie could have had a good story or just any amount of effort placed into its narrative or world building on top of the stuff that makes it a good video game movie. You can absolutely have both, and seeing so many people go up in arms because people who review films as a job didn't think the film was very remarkable will never not be funny to me, especially when most critics who didn't like the film still acknowledged the aspects of it that general audiences liked and acknowledged that fans would probably like it more than them. That doesn't really matter, you know, just a stupid suggestion really. You've brought a painstakingly and beautifully crafted vision of Mario's world to the big screen, so maybe do something interesting with it? I don't know. The film is enjoyable, but it's mid. Can I think that without being killed? No? Well, what else is new? <laughs> Before you ask, yes I am still working on that miraculous video. I'd like to finish it at some point, but I've got other projects I need to get done on top of that, and oh wait, is that a new Yakuza game? Well that's a good three weeks off my life gone right there. Oh, and Persona 2! I guess miraculous can wait, uh, how does indefinitely sound? Anyway, the miraculous movie. It f***ing stinks. It's incredible this movie even exists in the first place, I've been waiting on it for years now. I am indeed a fan of Miraculous, the same way someone says they're a fan of Tommy Wiseau, so I was expecting it to be bad. It just wasn't very funny in how bad it was, which made me very sad. The animation though, goddamn, it's uh, uncanny seeing Miraculous with actually good animation. Put the gun down, Thomas. This isn't a movie about Miraculous that you would expect it to be like, like it's a filler movie that still ties into the original show's canon. It's instead an origin story that also mixes and aspects of the TV storyline, which sounds interesting on the surface until you realize, oh wait, I'm watching Miraculous, they're going to waste this, aren't they? I'm very good at guessing things. The story is paper thin and like, it's miraculous. Everything that makes the show bad makes the movie bad, but it's not even hilariously bad like the show was. And that, that, th this is bullshit! That was my favorite part! I'd love to cover the film more in depth once my miraculous review is finished in three years from now. And this video doesn't aim to give an in-depth review on things. So right now, rest assured that this movie smells and I do not like it. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to like this one as much as I did, but color me shocked. You can probably tell I have a massive bias towards Christmas movies, I just love them to an insane degree. After Christmas is one of my favorite movies ever and more people need to watch it, but I didn't think a Batman Christmas special would be capable of charming me the way it did. It's such a cozy and likable movie, I don't understand why it has such a low score on IMDb- oh wait, yes I do! The art style may not be to everyone's taste and the animation isn't mind-blowing or anything, but it deserves so much more credit. Lighthearted takes on Batman are few and far between, and I'm happy to report 
to having a wholesome Batman movie leaning in on Batman as a happy parent that isn't the Lego Batman movie is such a breath of fresh air. However, instead of being a parody, which to Lego Movie's credit is still hilarious seven years later, it's a pretty earnest depiction of a happy and healthy Bruce Wayne raising his son. Partly because it's much more family oriented than Batman usually is, and it is a Christmas film. But that doesn't stop it from being such a stupidly charming film. Vocal performances are on point, and any downsides the film has are outweighed by my undying love and bias towards Christmas movies. I also just generally want more Batman stories that involve a happier Batman. As much as I love and will always love Batman's universal interpretation, it's just incredibly interesting and refreshing to see the stuff from a Batman story, even if it is wildly different compared to what we're used to from The Dark Knight. Definitely an underrated film that I suggest you go check out whenever you feel in the mood for Christmas cheer. So, like, 11 months from now? <laughs> honestly have no idea where people stand on Elemental anymore. Before and after the release of the film, it was bashed to hell and back as one of Pixar's worst and most painfully generic films. And after the first half of the year already consisted of tons of video essays and posts discussing the downfall of Pixar, hey, that's me, hello. It was just extremely unfortunate timing and the movie caught a lot of flack based on that alone. There was also the incredibly desperate marketing campaign and a strange fixation on trying to turn this puntable little sh** into a forced meme, only for it to backfire spectacularly. The movie wasn't much of a hit with critics and it was bombing financially. Financially. Then, at some point, a bunch of people realized the movie wasn't a god-awful tragedy and started gassing it up, and the film ended up being mildly profitable thanks to word of mouth. So now it's in this position where opinions on the film are so different depending on who you ask that there's almost no common ground to stand on. So I'm just gonna come out and say that I think Elemental is mid. I just really hate this movie on a conceptual level, and while I do like and appreciate how the story is based on the director's youth and how much of a personal story it is to them, it is still an incredibly generic film, and to me, only continues to prove that Pixar is losing its touch. Pixar will always be at the top of the industry when it comes to producing technically impressive animated movies using the latest technology and offering the most detailed visuals. Elemental, though visually uninspired, is still a very pretty film with some gorgeous lighting in particular, but I really wish they'd just experiment more with the actual animation. The film clearly has a different art style than what we're used to from Pixar, but it's still the same kind of insanely detailed animation that's beginning to lose a lot of its appeal. The plot, while borrowing from the director's own experiences, is still a fairly predictable tale that you've seen done before about familial expectations and systemic racism without a whole lot of innovation. It is quite literally what would happen if you got your groundbreaking idea for a Pixar movie straight from ChatGPT. Also, I'm not going to get into this movie's frankly embarrassing metaphor collapse because there are people far more qualified than me that can do it for me. And I don't want to talk about this movie anymore. Look guys, Elio better be good or I'm putting Pixar on my suicide note. <laughs> Makoto Shinkai, my man, you cannot miss. Well, I don't think Suzume is quite as good as your name, although to be fair, that is an incredibly tall order given how good the film already is. It is still an absolutely beautiful film. I am constantly blown away at the level of detail that goes into the animation for these films. Every single shot in this movie is a breathtaking work of art, and I'm incredibly upset I didn't get to see it on a big screen. My computer's monitor just cannot do the film enough justice. A lot of Western viewers are definitely going to be more focused on if this movie qualifies as a romance and asking if people would still love them if they too turned into a chair, but I think audiences outside of Japan tend to overlook the actual meaning behind everything in this film. It's centered around the infamous earthquake that hit Japan in 2011. Each location for one of the natural disasters represents a different consequence of said earthquake that can still be felt in Japan today. And the film does an excellent job at processing the grief and trauma the entire country is feeling while looking towards a better future. The act of literally closing doors that are causing the disasters directly links with this idea, and when you focus on this, it makes it so much easier to see why this film was so beloved in Japan and really shows just how well thought out and deeply touching it is. Suzume is a lot of things. Gorgeous, funny, action-packed, and incredibly thoughtful. I obviously am not a Japanese citizen, so I wasn't as emotionally impacted by it as a lot of people in Japan were, but that does not take away from it in the slightest, and I think it's an absolutely wonderful film that you should definitely check out. I think anyone should be able to appreciate a film this well-crafted, regardless of any cultural differences. <laughs> The Monkey King would have completely flown under my radar if my dad hadn't put it on for my little sister to watch, only for me to casually hear the name drop hell within the first five minutes. So naturally, I stuck around for a bit and got bored about halfway through the movie. I then finished it in my spare time the next day because I felt I had seen too much of it to back down now, and it would have probably been interesting to talk about. And to Monkey King's credit, there's certainly a fair bit to talk about even if the film itself is pretty unremarkable. I was pretty pleasantly surprised by the action scenes. In fact, the action scenes throughout the film honestly kick ass and are incredibly well animated. You don't see many CG 
animated movies making good use of impact frames in their animation, and I'm surprised it was Monkey King of all films that made me realize this. The film is incredibly energetic too. Like you can tell they were obviously trying to keep in line with children's attention spans in some areas, but it still helped me not fall asleep while I was watching it. I'm not against the concept of taking a long established Chinese novel and trying to make an entertaining kids movie out of it, but outside of the admittedly impressive animation, it hardly does much to innovate or take advantage of its story in new and interesting ways. You've seen these same jokes before, character arcs are predictable, and the story, despite being based on one of the most well-known pieces of Chinese literature, is practically an interest vacuum that modernizes the story in ways that make it far less intriguing. I guess I found the Monkey King himself fairly charming and entertaining, I mean the vocal performance is definitely doing a lot of work in that regard. In fact, the voice acting throughout is pretty good, I just wish all of these animation and voice acting talents were chosen for a substantially better and more interesting movie. <laughs> When I opened my Kung Fu Panda 4 trailer analysis on a joke about DreamWorks and people gassing them up over an accidental winning streak, I was surprised to see a lot of comments in defense of Trolls 3. Now this was incredibly confusing to me because since 2016, I had been led to believe by the internet that the Trolls franchise was one of DreamWorks most bland and forgettable series of films, and now I'm suddenly being told that not only do people like the third movie, people are also looking back fondly on the last two? Naturally I had to investigate, so I rewatched Trolls 3 once I started reading the comments, and in their defense the movie isn't as terrible as I first thought it was. It's actually a completely middle of the road film for me. Trolls just doesn't do it for me. I always got the impression these films were made exclusively for children unlike some of DreamWorks' other stuff which can be enjoyed by all ages, so I never had much of an interest in them to begin with, and any time I have watched one of them it has usually been entirely against my own will. Nevertheless, there is merit in Trolls 3. The villains are a standout for one, they're honestly really entertaining. The animation can get pretty creative, which is a positive all of the Trolls movies have to be honest, but this one takes it a lot further with some really vivid scenery and interesting art style shakeups for the obligatory put all of our characters on drugs sequence, and I was surprised by the sheer volume of jokes in the film too. That's not to say that more than half of them even land, but because there's so many of them and the ones that hit are actually pretty good, it makes this the most entertaining Trolls movie by default. Other than those things, I really don't care for the film otherwise. I don't like these movies very much, they are very much not for me. I like musicals, just not jukebox musicals, the musical numbers annoyed the shit out of me. Most of the characters are incredibly irritating. I see what other people are seeing in this film, but I just can't like it no matter how hard I try. Okay, you know how it feels to have to put an Ardman movie on the mid-tier? It's like having to put down your f***ing dog. Ardman is one of my favorite animation studios of all time. I love nearly everything they have ever produced and they have earned their rock-solid reputation for consistently making some of the greatest stop-motion films ever. But even with that reputation, never once did I see a single person soy pogging at the idea of a Chicken Run sequel. Who asked for a Chicken Run sequel? I mean, it's still Ardman, so I was gladly going to let them cook, but the more trailers that came out, the more disinterested I became. This didn't feel like Chicken Run run at all. It was falling for so many sequel traps that I genuinely feared the day I would have to watch it because I didn't want to be faced with the possibility that I disliked an Ardman movie. I f***ing liked Early Man. I don't know a single sod on the planet who likes Early Man, but I do. And after watching Chicken Run 2, while I'm thankful it wasn't a disaster and was fairly funny, all things considered, if there's one thing Ardman haven't lost, it's their ability to be consistently funny. The movie is just Chicken Run in name and characters alone. It sorely lacks the darker tone and themes of the original film. There are hardly any stakes in Chicken Run 2. It all feels weightless and like it's trying to have a light and comedic adventure. The original Chicken Run is a very funny movie, but it was also an incredibly well-rounded one that felt intelligently written, and it genuinely had some balls, may I remind you. Chicken Run 2 just feels sterile in comparison. It's obviously a very well-crafted film in every other aspect. Artman's models and their stop motion have never looked better, and their films will always have that timeless quality to them, but I really hope for that upcoming Wallace and Gromit movie that's supposed to come out sometime this year. They pull out all the stops for it. This was just a massive disappointment, and it honestly hurts me to even suggest that Artman missed for change. I caught a screening of this thanks to the benefit of being British, when's the last time I was able to say that, my god. And I'm aware the film hasn't had a wider release yet, so I'll attempt to keep this brief without giving much away. While it can be argued this is technically a live action movie, there is just so much effort put into every single painting that I can't help but be floored by this film. This movie was made by the same people who made Loving Vincent, which was already a pretty good film and absolutely breathtaking to look at. And while The Peasants doesn't really have much of a reason to be hand painted, unlike Loving Vincent, it's still such a unique looking movie and a remarkable visual achievement. It also 
also tells an incredibly poignant story about the cruelty and rampant misogyny in Poland back in the 1800s, bolstered by some absolutely incredible performances that are done more than enough justice by the detailed animation. I ultimately think this film is going to be super divisive once more people see it. It very much feels like a love it or hate it film, but it's beautifully made with a truly powerful story to boot. I'd say go into it if you're interested because it's definitely not for everyone, but the artistry on display is impeccable and the story is brutal and in equal parts beautiful. <laughs> Again, I already reviewed this one, so I'll attempt to keep this brief. As much as I make fun of this movie, it's still insanely depressing that this was all Disney had to show for their big 100 year anniversary. I mean, it wasn't the only thing, but it was the only thing they offered that I was mildly interested in. It's still wild how the concepts for the film are so much better than what we actually got, and it looks like at every possible term, Disney was trying to make the film as generic as humanly possible. I wish this film had a f***ing soul. Disney magic no longer exists. Disney magic hasn't existed for a while, honestly, it just became more apparent as I finish watching this film. They need to shake things up, but they won't, and they never will. They're too busy trying to convince everyone they're doing just as good as they were back in their golden age. One of the worst soundtracks in any Disney movie ever, incredibly hit or miss animation, a story so flavorless and disinteresting it would take a high school or five seconds to grade it based on a 10 word prompt they fed into an AI. The villain sucks, the main character sucks, F***ing peep the name, I'm magnificent. Get this atrocity out of my goddamn face. One of the worst movies I've seen all year. Its very existence is an insult to art. <laughs> <laughs> funny Adam Sandler movie, Rotten Tomatoes percentage Disney. It's basically all I've heard about Leo before actually watching it myself. And, uh, yeah, this movie is miles better than Wish by a frankly comical amount, actually. I definitely don't think this is a great film by any metric, but for an animated musical comedy starring Adam Sandler, it could have done a lot worse. The musical part of it is arguably the worst aspect, but everything else is fine. The story was surprisingly sweet, I didn't expect it to be that touching. Not Pixar level brilliance, obviously, but there's definitely effort put into it despite it being a random Netflix animated movie that dropped with basically zero marketing besides one trailer that got people's attention. It's not a very funny movie at all, nor is it really all that unique, but if you for some reason wanted a movie where Adam Sandler plays a 70 year old lizard acting as a mentor to a bunch of school kids, then this is the movie for you, whoever you are. <laughs> This is definitely the most vibrant and colourful movie about the brutal horrors of war and military fascism. For real though, these visuals are absolutely exquisite. Even when it gets incredibly gory, the film is still incredibly vibrant and incredible to look at. Make no mistake, Unicorn Wars is undeniably provocative and definitely not subtle with its themes. Well, as not subtle as you can get when you have the word war in the title. A fact that Star Wars fans have struggled to comprehend for the past 40 years. It's an incredibly crude film from its humour and violence alone, yet it still possesses a respectable amount of maturity and depth. It's easy to just show a bunch of cutesy characters on screen and then smash them into a pile of blood and guts just to say, look guys, I made a subversion, but it goes far beyond the surface level, using its visuals and cutesy character designs to really highlight the ridiculousness of war and the depths mankind will go to in order to slaughter people over differing ideologies. If you've heard any amount of criticism of war as a concept before, which is very likely, the explanation alone may make you roll your eyes a bit, but the film communicates these ideas in such an effective way and given the current state of the world, this film couldn't have chosen a better time to release. It's still a pretty violent and disturbing film, but if you can stomach that kind of stuff, then definitely give this a watch. The animation alone is worth giving it a shot. <laughs> I'm just so happy so incredibly happy. It's hard for me to truly get into this without doing an entire analysis of Venture Bros itself, so I wouldn't stay here for too long. But I'm just so happy Venture Bros got to go out of a bang like this. It's been one of my favourite shows for the longest time, and the wait between the last season and this movie was just too much to bear. Especially when news of the show's cancellation hit. And while it obviously feels like they wanted to do so much more of this movie, given it's essentially the remains of the eighth season they were halfway through making before the show was axed, this film neatly rounds out the entire series with so much love and care that it's hard not to get emotional if you've been following the series for as long as I have, or even longer. While I think the world could obviously stand to gain from more Venture Bros, if this is the last time we'll see these stupid, lovable characters, then I'm happy it ended the way it did. <laughs> Six 
similarly to DreamWorks, though far less justifiable, lots of people began gassing up Illumination after the breakout success of the Mario movie because gamers are f***ing idiots. I know this because I am one. The Mario movie was essentially on par with the quality of most of Illumination's films, outside of Despicable Me 1, which still holds up incredibly well to this day, honestly. But everyone got blinded by the fact that it was a fun video game movie for Mario fans and just couldn't accept that the movie was anything less than a 10 out of 10 experience. Like that film or not, it made no sense to me why people were suddenly switching up on Illumination over one positively received film in the eyes of the public after a full decade of treating the studio as one of the worst in the industry, especially because nothing about migration even remotely suggested that it was going to be above standard fare for Illumination. Like yeah, the movie looks pretty, I like how they blended elements of 2D into it, and the scenery is very nice with a distinct painterly look to it. Doesn't change how this movie borrows from several far superior films and plays things incredibly safe. Also, Aquafina is in this movie. <laughs> I'm getting sick of this woman. She is in everything. This is an incredibly inoffensive film that you can stick on in the background while you lie on your bed and dissociate into the Guilty Gear soundtrack or whatever it is you do in your free time. It's certainly better than a lot of other Illumination films, but that's the extent of it. <laughs> I have regrettably not read the Blue Giant manga, though I am definitely looking to change that at some point because my god this absolutely blew me away. While it may have some issues with its character development being a tad rush and the usage of CGI isn't exactly what I'd call graceful when compared to the beautiful 2D animation and artwork, Blue Giant is an absolute marvel and an incredibly moving film. I have heard from some fans that this film was made with mostly manga readers in mind, and that a lot of the characters that show up don't get the proper amount of time to be explored and developed like they do in the manga, but this is still a film I can see anyone tapping into and getting an unforgettable experience out of. The music. Dear god, this music. This movie's OST is a gift from the gods. It is so smooth. If you love jazz in any capacity, you owe it to yourself to give this movie's soundtrack a listen. If I could play it without getting a copyright claim, I would, but it is so powerful and sounds just so good. I cannot express this in words that are calm. Hell, if you like jazz or just appreciate it at all, this movie is likely going to appeal to you anyway. It's such a respectably earnest showcase of pure love for the genre, aware that it's a dying genre, but still choose to make an absolutely ecstatic show of what makes it so beloved. Please do whatever you can to see this movie, it is a criminally overlooked masterpiece. Look, I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I don't have a whole lot to say about this movie because it's not really much of a film. It's more so just a feature-length spectacle with some incredibly impressive set pieces and animation. Regrettably, I don't watch a lot of Chinese animation, and some of the stuff I have seen from China is shockingly good from an animation standpoint, so I feel obligated to acknowledge this given I didn't watch much overseas stuff this year. Nevertheless, I still got some enjoyment out of this as a pure spectacle film, and I was hardly bored. But I found the story to be incredibly incoherent and messy, and the visuals really were the only thing keeping me from succumbing to my awful sleep schedule due to how Dull the narrative was. Not helped by the frankly pathetic dialogue, and I can't tell if it's a translation issue or not, but it got really grating at points. And for as much as this film's visuals absolutely rock, the editing is genuinely so bad and choppy that it subtracts a fair bit of the wow factor whenever I notice a weird cut. When you do this stuff for a living, you tend to notice stupid sh like this, and it gets on my nerves. Bohemian Rhapsody winning an Oscar for Best Editing was my Pearl Harbor. There's no real reason to check this out, but it's not doing much harm, honestly. Mid. As excited as I was for Studio Ghibli's grand return, we're just going to ignore that little episode they had in 2020, I was definitely not prepared for The Boy and the Heron. This is far and away one of Ghibli's most profoundly mature and complex movies, and definitely the most personal thing that Miyazaki has ever made. It certainly feels like a film that would cap off someone's career, as much as Miyazaki would like you to think that, this man is insane, but the way this film draws from Miyazaki's own childhood experiences and the way it deals with so many events that draw direct parallels to those experiences is so raw and barely filtered, and emotionally powerful. It's a very different film that I both would expect and did not expect would come from Ghibli. They are masters of their craft and have expertly covered relatable and dark themes before, but never to this extent. It lacks a lot of the lightheartedness and whimsy that most Ghibli films tend to have, and it's still there to an extent, but far more subdued and less concerned with having a family-friendly appeal. It's no wonder then that a fair few Ghibli fans are a little divided on the film, being so different from what they're used to after a decade-long absence. I'm glad that most people went into this film with an open mind though, because it is a truly fascinating addition 
changed in the Ghibli's catalogue, and the personal and mature nature of the story allows any viewer to interpret it in a way that's most meaningful to them. And analysing the way it draws from Miyazaki's life, a man who has notoriously avoided covering personal themes in his work, is incredibly interesting. As expected from Ghibli, the film's animation is second to none, just jaw-droppingly detailed and beautiful to look at from beginning to end. No one does it like Ghibli. And even though Miyazaki is likely going to keep working on movies until the sun blows up, The Boy in the Heron stands as one of his and Ghibli's greatest creations and one of the best films to release in 2023. <laughs> Look, I don't think any of you are really surprised that Spider-Verse took the top spot. It's a predictable choice, but I can't deny that this was easily one of, if not the best film I saw in 2023. Though admittedly, that love has been shaken a bit after hearing the horror stories behind this movie's production, and Lord and Miller's complete and utter refusal to listen to anyone's thoughts on the matter of treating your animators with respect is incredibly disappointing as someone who's been a fan of them for so long. I'm still excited for Beyond the Spider-Verse, but they just cannot be treating animators like this. It's so disappointing, which makes it more than justified for me to acknowledge that everyone who worked on this movie truly gave it their all. There is no other movie that looks like Spider-Verse. Even films that are inspired by Spider-Verse's existence set themselves apart from it to go and do their own thing, which makes this movie so much more special. Every frame, every detail, every aspect of this movie's visuals is a celebration of the medium itself. And throughout the hellish production this film went through, these animators still went above and beyond and still managed to pour their love of animation into every fibre of this film's being. The surprisingly meta yet completely sincere and heartfelt story exploring the concept of Spider-Man as a whole, what it truly means to be Spider-Man, constantly defying expectations in ways that respects the audience's intelligence, and pushes the plot and characters forward in meaningful directions, the absolutely excellent score, the sheer abundance of fan service without overtaking the entire movie or coming off as desperate or cringe, the spectacular action sequences, I think have gone on long enough. I love Across the Spider-Verse with all my heart. It stands tall with the first movie as one of my favourite movies of all time. While I will always be against the awful conditions the animators were put through and it deserves to be called out, it's just as important to acknowledge the incredible work they managed to do, and I hope whatever they do next will be done with a far healthier workload and better conditions. Oh, and f**k Lord and Miller. Jackasses. You can keep the clone high season free, thanks. Well, that's it for the ranking. Before I end the video, I'm going to quickly list a bunch of animated movies that are releasing sometime next year, or sometime in the future, I don't know, that I hope you will also take an interest in. Chicken for Linda. The art and animation is very unique and it looks adorable. Robot Dreams. It looks super charming and I've heard it's made people cry, so that'll be fun. Mars Express. This looks awesome, I just have absolutely no idea when it's going to release. Kensuke's Kingdom. Jesus Christ, the animation on this looks amazing, no idea when it's out though. Anyway, thanks for for watching. See you whenever I have free time, I guess. I sort of worked myself to the bone last year, so I'm gonna wait a bit before coming insane with uploads again, so take care. Play Yakuza. <laughs>